Would you open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8? Nehemiah 8, we'll look at verses 1 through 12 this morning. And I mentioned in Praise Night that this is one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. And there's a companion to this that we're going to read in a moment. But I, I think you'll probably recognize that the content has impacted our order of service here at the church. I found these uh, two chapters that we'll look at, uh, one in Second Kings and the other, or I'm sorry, Second Chronicles and the other in our text this morning. And uh, as I prepared for our time, there was something else that came to mind, and that's from Second Kings. It's the, the boy king's reign, King Josiah. And there were 77 years of evil reign under the exceedingly wicked, who the Bible says he was more evil than any other kings of Judah, King Manasseh and his son Ammon. They ruled 55 and 22 years respectively. And the boy king Josiah became king of Judah at eight years old. He reigned for 31 years. And in contrast, we're told that he had done good in the sight of the Lord. Now, during the 18th year of his 31 year reign, this happened. Second Kings 22, eight to 13, then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, King Josiah, bringing the king word saying, your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hand of those who do the work and oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now it happened. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he tore his clothes, an outward sign of mourning. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, uh, Ahikim, the son of Shaphan, Achbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah, the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book, that has been found for great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do every according to all that is written concerning us. Now, the reason for that lengthy read is it tells us that Judah had not heard the word of God for 95 years. And thus it showed up within the behavior of the kings and the people. And when the word of the Lord was found and read to King Josiah, Here's what happened in 2 Kings 23, 1 to 3. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people took a stand for the covenant. Are you willing to stand for the covenant today? Yeah. The new covenant in Christ's blood. Now the situation in our text is not quite as extreme as far as the length of time without hearing the word but the end result is the same. And I think we'll recognize the parallels between what we just read and what we're about to read in Nehemiah. Now, the reason that we need to focus on what we're going to look at this morning is that as we study the word of God, what it's going to teach us about is, and here's our title, living powerful, living powerful. Now, isn't that the kind of Christian life we want to have? We don't want to just exist. We don't want to muddle our way through. We want to have powerful walks with God. Amen? Amen. And for the southern kingdom of Judah, the word brought an explanation for their current condition as a people by exposing their dis disobedience. And it also brought sorrow. And this was followed by repentance and recommitment. And the people took a stand for the covenant of God and returned to living powerful. Now, in Psalm 119, which I believe David authored, he asked this question. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to what? Your word. With my whole heart, similar to what we just read in 2 Kings 23, with my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. 
Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against you. In our text today, we'll be joined by Ezra the scribe, a contemporary, obviously, of Nehemiah, and others who knew and could explain the word of God. And we'll learn a few lessons from the reactions of the people after they heard and understood the word of the Lord. Now, let's examine this living and powerful text from the living and powerful word of God and learn like Judah under King Josiah and those who returned after the Babylonian captivity under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah about living powerful as we allow the living and powerful word of God to wash over us. And hopefully we'll leave this place today. And this is my desire to leave change forever. Somebody say Amen. Amen. Now, would you stand and read with me, please, the first of our verses, which will be Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And as I said, we'll finish all the way down to verse 12 before we're done. Nehemiah 8, 1 to 3, verse 1. Now, all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Lord, we want ears to hear what your spirit is saying this morning. We pray, God, that you would move in our hearts and our minds, and that would in, uh, in turn translate into action in our feet and hands. So we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity from this powerful chapter. Teach us what you would have us to learn, we ask. For we ask it in the name above all of us, the name of Jesus Christ, the righteous, our Lord, our King, our Savior. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now we're told there uh, the people are meeting on the first day of the seventh month. We're also told that the people were as one for the reading of the Pentateuch, the law, the first five books, which the Lord gave to Israel through Moses. Now it should draw our minds to Psalm 133, which says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell in being argumentative. No, no in what? In unity, oneness. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Isn't that what we've been promised? Eternal life, life forevermore. And oil running down on Aaron's beard points back to Leviticus 8, where Aaron and his sons were consecrated by the Lord and symbolized by the anointing of pouring oil on their heads, which ran down their beards and onto their garments. And the reason for this illustration or historical pointing back was it was a holy moment and this parallel was being drawn with what is in front of us today. It was a holy moment. Don't you want to have a holy moment today? And I'm sure that most of us have had a hiatus of some length from doing what we should. Hello, we have all had a hiatus to some degree from doing what we should. Maybe it's just reading the Bible on a regular basis. Maybe it's doing the things that God has convicted or called us to do. And I think we would all recognize that when we get back to doing what we should be doing, it feels pretty good. Instantly, our spirit is ministered to, and we recognize that we're back on track. Now, the first day of the seventh month begins the fall feast days of Israel. And this is the month uh, of the uh, beginning of the Feast of Trumpets, or as we call it today, Rosh, Rosh Hashanah. Now, this is followed by Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, then the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, which is the subject of chapters 13, or verses 13 to 18 of our chapter, which we'll get to later on. Not later on today, later on. Now, <laughs> The word had not been read for 95 years in the days of King Josiah. And I'm sure that in pagan Babylon, it was scarce for some 70 years. But get this, and we'll look ahead into our uh, next verses a little bit for a moment. In 817, 
We're told the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booze and sat under the booze, for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. In other words, Israel had not done what God directed them to do since Joshua took over for Moses. What was the end result? And there was a uh, was very great what? Gladness. Listen, Joshua died in 1245 B.C. Our text takes place in somewhere around 430 B.C. So the Feast of Tabernacles had not been observed for some 815 years. But what happened when they got back to doing the right thing? It brought gladness to the people. And that's exactly what will happen with us when we get back to doing what we ought to be doing as instructed by the Lord. Now, in the open square in front of the water gate, the water gate was actually part of the wall, the people met to hear the law of Moses. Now, there's some debate among scholars as to the meaning of those who could hear with understanding, and some say that refers to language. Others say it's a reference to spiritual maturity. And remember, some of these people that were now back in Jerusalem were actually born in Babylon. They've lived their whole life under Babylonian culture and language. And remember, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given uh, Babylonian names, as was Daniel. Now, these people had lived with that as their sole influence. And you can debate all you want whether that means whether they could understand the language or understand the meaning of the words. But the fact is, there's something more important than which one of those interpretations you land on. And that is that the word morning here means first light or sunrise. Midday is noon. So listen this morning. Here's what I wanted to highlight. The people listened to the word of God for five or six hours. So I don't ever want to hear about going long in a sermon again. Now today, interestingly, if you go over 45 minutes, people start closing their Bibles and looking at their watch in some places, not this place. Not this place, right? And there's other places where they don't even read the Bible. And they go about 20 minutes because that's the attention span of many today. And the reason we needed to point out the long breaks between the reading of the word or the hearing of the law and certainly the doing of what the word said, as with the case of the Feast of Tabernacles, 815 years of disobedience. And I want you to consider this this morning. Maybe you're in one of those seasons. You haven't been doing what you should. You haven't been in the word regularly. Well, here's what we need to glean. Listen this morning, the power and promises of God's word do not diminish over time the power and promises of god's word do not diminish over time now of course since the holy spirit is god god is the same yesterday today and forever therefore his word doesn't change amen but the point is this maybe you haven't read the word for a while maybe you've not done what you have should have should have done for a while but when you open the book and read what it says and do what it says to do, it's still going to be true for you. No matter how long the break. After all, there are no penalties for ignoring it in the sense that God says, well, you haven't read it for six weeks, so I want you to read it for six weeks and then its content will be applicable to you. That's not how God operates. Listen, when you open this book, it is living and powerful. And even if you haven't opened it as often as you should, its promises and its power is immediately accessible to you once again. Yeah. Now, obviously, 1 Corinthians 2.14 points out the natural man cannot uh, discern the things of God because they're spiritual. But we who have been born again, we don't always do what we should. Hello? We don't always do what we should. As I said, we take breaks sometimes from right thinking and right behavior. But as soon as we get back to the book, it begins to resonate with our spirits once again. And we begin to be drawn into what God has for us, which is always better than what we have for ourselves. And David would write in Psalm 119, 65 to 68, you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Did David ever mess up? Did God still deal well with him? 
teach me good judgment and knowledge. Yeah, there were occasions where he didn't have either. For I believe your commandments. Listen to this. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I do what? I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Listen, afflictions come from not keeping the word of God. And we all have wandered off into whether thinking or actions that were inconsistent with what God has for us, which is always the best. But when we return to keeping his word, the good God who gave us his good word will not bar us from experiencing his promises because we went astray. Get back to the book and you will find its principles, precepts, and statutes to be available to you immediately. Even after 815 years of not keeping a feast day, or 95 years of not having read his word, or however long it had been from these post-exilic uh, Jews or members of the tribe of Judah after the Babylonian captivity, when they got back to the book and did what the book said, there was ultimately gladness and the blessings of the promises of the word began to flow again. So should you be in the word of God every day? Well, of course you should. Does it impact your spiritual life when you're not? Yes, it does. Is the integrity of scripture or the power of God's promises diminished because you haven't done what you should do? No, of course not. And this, so again, Psalm 119. Let's just go ahead and read the whole Psalm 119. <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. 89 to 93, David says, Forever, O Lord, your word is what? Settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances, for all are your servants. Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me what? Life, Psalm 119, 176 verses. Every single one of them pointing to the importance and the power of the word of God. And these verses we just read highlight for us that the word never changes. It never diminishes. It is settled, which means to stand forever in the heavens. And remember what was said to Joshua when Moses had died and the Lord gave him exactly what he needed to hear. He told Joshua, who had to be intimidated by the task assigned to him after Moses' death, but the Lord said, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. And then he gave him this word of counsel. He said in one eight of Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to what? To do, not just know it, but to do according to all that is written in it. And when you meditate in it day and night, when you observe to do what you just read, then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. There's a progression there, right? We need to be in the word to understand the benefits of the word so we can do what brings us the benefits of the word. And in Psalm 1, David captures the same concept where he says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates how often? Day and night. Here's the end result. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall what? Now, we can't look at this like the prosperity teachers teach us. That's not what is being said. Just like with Joshua, prosperity, good success, and being fruitful like a fruitful tree planted by a river uh, that will not wither, all describe living, powerful through the concepts and precepts of God's word. And this is born out of meditating, meaning studying the word of God. That's why we study the word of God here. Amen. Amen. And, you know, somebody had uh, visited the church one time, came to watch one of their grandkids and one of our Christmas plays some years ago. And the report was afterwards that uh, they said of me, you know, he's a good communicator, but he sure quotes the Bible a lot. <laughs> well, you know what? Nothing has changed. We're going to keep quoting the Bible. Amen. 
Because that's where the hope is. That's where the power is. That's where the directions are. Listen, I'm not up here to give you my opinion or what I think. I'm up here to teach you what the Bible says and how it's going to benefit you and how you can leave this place living more powerful today than ever before. And listen, if it's been a while since you've been regular in his book, the Bible has not lost its power. It's still activated immediately as soon as you get back to doing what it says to do. Now, let's look at verses 4 through 8. Verse 4. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him at his, his right hand stood, you read these out loud, <laughs> Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maseah, and at his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashum, Hashpadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Good job. <laughs> and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Maseah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, uh, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. I was telling Terry, I couldn't help but think of this as our opening verse talks about the people had made a platform of wood uh, for the purpose of having the Levites and Ezra, who was going to read the word, stand in a way where he could be seen and heard by all of the people. And some years ago, a friend of mine had said, hey, there's a Greek scholar who's going to be in town. And, uh, you know, you ought to have him come speak at the church. So we sent out an invitation uh, to all the local pastors. We had quite a few guys come. This is way back on 6th Street when we were in our uh, our first sanctuary. And there were, I don't know, 150 guys showed up, uh, pastors and leaders from local churches. And this guy got up there and he said, shame on you for building platforms to stand upon so you are elevated above the people. You ought to be down at the level that people are sitting at, you know, where they can't see you. <laughs> and, it, I mean, he just berated everybody for having a platform. And, you know, me being the host, and I had about all I was going to put up with from this guy. And I got up and said, well, interesting that in Nehemiah chapter 8, they built a platform for the priests and the Levites to stand so they were high enough to be seen and heard by the people. So I told the guys that were present, keep your platforms. This guy didn't have anything to say with me after uh, to me afterwards. I don't know why, but, you know, th there's a purpose for having a stage, right? And, and it's nothing about pride or any of the other things. This guy was trying to throw at everybody. But one thing I wanted to highlight to you, it's one of my favorite practices that I've ever read about in the church, and it comes from Scotland. And during a church service in Scotland, there was a, a an attendant who was called a beadle, B-E-A-D-L-E. Not a beetle like John Paul, George, and Ringo, but a beetle. And his job was to carry the Bible down the center aisle and set it on the lectern for the pastor to preach out of. And you know what happened as soon as his foot hit the floor of the sanctuary? The people stood. And they still do that to this day. And it's a recognition to stand in honor of the Word of God. And that's why we stand when we read the word of God here as well. And we see the biblical foundation for that in our verses. Ezra opened the book and the people stood. Now, that's a good thing, right? Now, we're going to make a point here in a minute. But listen, anytime we run across a, a series of names, I always start digging after what Chuck Mister stumbled onto uh, back in Genesis chapter 5. You know, there's a, a genealogy that runs from Adam to Noah. In Genesis chapter 5, you know, where you've got these massive numbers of years that people lived, lived and we're told over and over, you know, Adam lived and Seth was born and Enosh was born and 
on down the line and what age they died at and when they had uh, their firstborn son and all that. And what Missler stumbled onto is that when you start with Adam, which means man, and you move to Seth, which means appointed, and you go all the way to Noah, which means comfort, there's a message there that says, man, appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring, that's the meaning of Methuselah, the despairing, that's the meaning of Lamech, comfort, that's the meaning of Noah. So the genealogy says, man, appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing comfort. That's pretty hefty stuff, right? So I started looking at these names, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Mattathiah means the gift of Jehovah. Uh, Shema means to hear. Aniah means Jehovah has answered. Urijah means Jehovah is my light or fire. Hilkiah means my portion is Jehovah. And uh, Masaiah means the work of Jehovah. At his left hand, uh, uh, Padiah stood. And his name means Jehovah has, has ransomed. Mishael, uh, in English translated Michael, who is like God. Malchijah, my king is Jehovah. Hashum means rich. Hashpadana means considerate, judge. Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. And Meshulam means friends. Now listen, if you string all these together, and like with what Mr. found, you throw in a preposition here and there uh, and one pronoun, what it says is the gift of Jehovah will hear, and Jehovah has answered. Jehovah is my light, my portion, my work. Jehovah has ransomed. Who is like God? My king is Jehovah, a rich, considerate judge. Jehovah remembers his friends. That's pretty cool. Amen? And, you know, that's why we don't skip over stuff in the Bible. There's always something for us to learn. Now, there's a list of Levite names in verse 7. And you know what the message is there? I don't either. I couldn't find one. But I just, I thought the one, I thought, okay, maybe there's another one here. But I, I thought that was interesting. But what it tells us is that the name of the Lord, Proverbs 18.10 says, is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it and are saved. And listen, there's 23 names listed here amongst those who stood on either side of Ezra and the Levites who helped give the sense. And of the 23 names listed here, 15 of them include the word or name Jehovah in the meaning of the name. And add to that, Nehemiah's name means Jehovah comforts. Jehovah comforts and Ezra's name means help. Does the Lord help us? Is he a comfort to us? And all the other things we just read? Listen, uh, there's only one thing to say after that. There's power in the name of Jesus. Now, his name says he answers our cries. His name says he is our light. His name says he is our portion. His name says he is our work. His name says he has ransomed us. His name says, who is like our king, Jehovah, rich in mercy and kindness, a considerate judge, to his friends. Aren't you glad that God is kind to us when we mess up? Because he bought us with the blood of his own son. And Amos reminds us in 9.6, he who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Deuteronomy 33 says in verse 26, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun, that's a name for a Jerusalem, who rides the heavens to do what? To help you and in his excellency on the clouds. Psalm 68, 4 says, sing to God, sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds and by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. And listen, when the book was opened and Ezra blessed the Lord, the people answered, Amen, Amen. And they lifted their hands. They bowed their heads with their faces to the ground. And this is one of the reasons I love this chapter. Because everything we just talked about happened before the word was read. And that parallels our worship time. It isn't just a buffer to allow the latecomers to get into church. Right? There's a purpose in it. 
And another, my favorite passage is a parallel that I mentioned when we began this morning. Another chapter that is one of my favorites comes at the dedication of the Temple of Solomon. And in 2 Chronicles 5, 11 through the first portion of verse 6, uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, we're told, and it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites, who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Haman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps. They were the orchestra. And with them, 120 priests, sounding with trumpets. Now listen close. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. What are the next three words? Then Solomon spoke. The people said, so be it when Ezra blessed the Lord. Their hands went up, their faces went down, their knees to the ground, and at the dedication of Solomon's temple, when there was unity and praise to the Lord, the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Then Solomon spoke. That's why we take time to offer the fruit of our lips, the sacrifice of praise to God before the message begins. And listen, here's our takeaway this morning. It's a bit long, but it's worth it. Listen, the more you know of the character of God, the more your life will reflect it. The more you know of the character of God, the more your life will reflect it. And Nehemiah 8 and 2 Chronicles 5 highlight the purpose of the time of worship before hearing the word. And let me just say this this morning. You ready? The worship time is not a time where we sing about ourselves. We sing about and to him exclusively. And doctrine matters in worship songs. We don't sing stuff because it makes us feel good. We sing the words that are appropriate for a great and awesome God who is all powerful and almighty. And as we sing of his goodness and greatness, our spirits are going to begin to react with lifted hands and bowed faces and unity of the spirit. And remember, all of this in Nehemiah 8 was prefaced back in chapter 1 by one guy who had a broken heart for the city of God in which the Lord said, my name will be there perpetually. And what I want to point out from that is that this burden for the Lord was contagious. And we have seen it spread in all of our chapters. And, you know, it's interesting. I've heard over the years, you know, people said, you know, the first time I came to the church I was kind of nervous. Because I came to uh, out of a church where nobody says anything. And here you are all, always trying to get us to say something. Well, because we're studying the word of God. And somebody better say amen. I mean, that's in the book, right? When they heard the word, they said amen, amen. And there was even during the time of worship, there was a physical reaction. They lifted their hands in the air. They bowed their faces before God because they understood that he is great and they are nothing without him. Yeah. And oh, does the church need that kind of thinking today? And listen, there are times during worship when we're singing about our great and awesome God that it almost feels sinful not to respond physically. How can I sit here with my hands in my pockets or on my hands or not react somehow Physically, and sometimes I just find myself just bowing my head as far as it can go without falling off my shoulders because I'm just in awe of who he is. And as we're singing about him and his greatness, so many things come to mind. And listen, sometimes life is hard. 
And sometimes evil people seem to get away with stuff that they ought to be caught for. And listen, I find myself combating that by remembering what God has done for me. And sometimes I I don't think the way that I should. But then I remember God is merciful towards me. Sometimes I get aggravated with people's actions. And I remember God's forgiveness for me. And it calms my spirit toward the other person. Sometimes I get frustrated with this world and the idiotic things that are now the norm. And I remember someday God's going to come and fix all this stuff. He's going to straighten it all out and it changes my whole outlook. And I hope it does for you too. I like the old saying, one uplook can change your whole outlook. And all those things I just said, I learned from his word. And it keeps us living powerful instead of emotional. And that's how we need to be living in times such as these. Amen. Amen. Now let's uh, wrap it up with verses 9 through 12. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. Now remember what Josiah did when he heard the word. He tore his clothes. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, get on the keto diet. (laughs) Now it can't be because the next phrase, drink the sweet and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Remember the comparison about when Aaron and his boys were anointed. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people saying, be still for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to sin portions and do what? Rejoice Rejoice greatly. Why? Because they understood the words that were declared uh, to them. Now listen, when the word was distinctly read and those called by God to help people understand it, accomplish their calling it was a holy day to the lord and the people realized what the word actually said it caused them to weep which again also leads to living powerful and in john 6 5 through 11 jesus told his disciples but now i go away to him who sent me and none of you asked me where are you going but because i said these things to you sorrow has filled your heart nevertheless i tell you the truth it's to your advantage that i go away For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will do what? Convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin. Because they do not, of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Satan was defeated on the cross The male child crushed his head as Genesis 3.15 prophesied. Now, the Holy Spirit is the author of the word of God. Amen. Amen. And therefore, when we read the word of God, we are going to be convicted. We are going to be convicted of sin and it will call us to live righteously. But that's a good thing, right? And those who reject the word in the Bible's revelation that all have sinned and will not experience the glory of God, cannot experience the joy of being made righteous through Christ. And Ezra says to the people, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing to prepare for themselves. And the Levites reiterated what uh, Ezra had said and called the people to be still. Stop crying and weeping. Don't be grieved, but rather rejoice that they understood what was declared to them. And listen this morning. You still here? If you ever come to church and hear something from the Bible that is convicting, rejoice. Rejoice because the Holy Spirit is resonating with what was spoken. Don't pout. Hello. Don't throw a tantrum. You know, there's a lot of people today when they hear something they don't like, they don't change their ways, they change churches. And that's not how we ought to handle the word of God. Amen. Amen. And listen, when you're convicted, that means the Spirit of God is at work in you and you're not a reprobate sinner, but a redeemed one. And he's prepping you further for living powerfully. 
And in Hebrews 4, 12 to 13, we're told the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give what? We must give an account. And listen, if we understand the nature and character of God, we're going to have our own nature and character revealed. And we're going to find that to be very convicting. And that's a good thing. I go as far to say that's even a God thing. And if you recognize there's nothing hidden from him and he sees all, that should impact our everyday life and our actions. And listen, one of the things I think we need to keep in mind is that when we continually study the word and when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it will keep us from spiritual silliness. And there's an abundance of that going on today. And you know, it's interesting that there are, are many churches that, that when they don't teach the word, they concoct some kind of replacement to bring about some type of response uh, to what's happening within the room. And listen, we hear the word, and my hope is that we all will understand it. And then we go away more like the Lord than when we came. We rejoice and send portions to the less fortunate. And as a result, we find ourselves living powerful. Now listen, here's our last point. It's already been made a handful of times, but here it is in, in capsule form. Listen, the living and powerful word teaches us how to live a powerful life. It's just that simple. The living and powerful word teaches us how to live a powerful life. You know, and when we watch some of the stuff going on in church today, and a lot of it is pretty dumb, and there's a lot of things that are, are actually contradictions to the word of God, we find ourselves, as I said a moment ago, uh, trying to replace what should come naturally from teaching the word. You know, there are times I've been looking forward to today ever since I figured out that you know, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 8. I love this chapter. And as I said, you know, it's from this that we started standing when uh, we're reading the word of God. And from Second Chronicles, uh, the value. And I've talked to different worship groups over the years. And uh, I was a, a chaplain for a ministry that managed a bunch of bands years ago. And this is when I, uh, the Lord led me to share this with them. And, you know, just, uh, you know, it, it says the trumpeters and the singers, they were all Levites. They were spiritually mature people you don't just throw anybody up on the stage hello <laughs> doesn't matter if they're the best singer in the world if they don't know jesus they got no business up here amen, amen? Yeah. but there's something else i learned at the church we were a part of for a long time is you can have people who are great musicians and singers who love jesus with all of their heart soul mind and strength i'd rather have that package wouldn't you yeah. and that way we get the best of all get the best of both so to speak and there's a lot of things that are taught and experienced within a church service that make people feel good in some places but they don't have the power to pull down enemy strongholds which is far more important than having a time where you got to run around the room and jump up and down and do all this stuff that made you feel good and then faded away on the drive home we need stuff that lasts right because anybody can come in here and say oh, i'm living powerful Surrounded by other Christians. But living powerful needs to happen in the office and on the campus and at the grocery store and in the gas station. And when we leave here, when the other team is out there in full array doing all the stuff that they do, especially in times such as these. And listen, in spite of just going for the experiential, if you hear the living and powerful word of God, if you find yourself from time to find, time to time convicted to the point of repentance, which causes times of refreshing to come, you leave ready to wrestle with principalities and powers and pull down enemy strongholds. Right. Isn't that the better of the two? Yeah. Yeah. And just some emotional moment that lasts for the length of any particular song that resonates with your feelings. Now listen, Hebrews tells us in 10, 19 to 25, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. How? Without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now listen, I honestly feel bad for people who search out a feel-good place and call it going to church because the central focus is on them, not him. And when we focus on him, we begin to understand his greatness. And that's why Paul could say in that famed passage in Philippians 4.13, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do limited supply. I can do meagerness. I, I can do hunger. I can do all the experiences that uh, I've had in my life. And he would say to the church at Galatia in 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And listen, this is far more important than singing a, a couple of songs or doing jumping jacks or whatever and, and making you feel like you've had an encounter. Listen, it's when we get out of here that we need him to go with us. And we need to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And listen, when we understand and see him as he is through his word, it's then and only then that we can begin to realize greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. That's pretty important stuff, isn't it? And that's what the purpose of coming together as a body of believers and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together but exhorting one another, building one another up, so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I have to say, as for me and my house, we're going to choose the living and powerful word of God over speeches that tell me how important I am. I don't need that, right? You know, and isn't it funny that in our world today, people are being told you just need to understand how important you are. Well, that's our whole problem. We think we're too important. It's called pride, right? And none of us have any shortage of it. As a matter of fact, in the famed passage in Ephesians, it says, no one ever hated himself. The fact that we love ourselves is the cause of many of the problems we see going on in our world today. You know, people don't like to hear uh, you know, there's something wrong with you. You're a sinner. You need a savior. Oh, well, that's not very kind. You're not very tolerant of my interpretation of who God is. That's not how my God is. Well, I got news for you. There's only one God. And you don't define who he is. He is who the Bible says he is. And if he says, don't do it, don't do it. If he says, do that instead, do that instead. And that's the end of that story. Amen. Now, we need to come to that place where Josh, like Joshua did in that famed 2415 passage as during his farewell speech. You know, you guys, whatever. Go worship the Amorites, the gods on the other side of the river like your fathers did. But I don't care what you're doing. I'll tell you what I'm doing. As for me and my house, we're going to what? We're going to serve the Lord. Now, in John 8, 29 to 30, Jesus speaking, he said, and he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Oh, that that would be our testimony. I always do those things that please him. And I say that for this reason. I think we would do well to say that when we always do what pleases the father, people are going to believe in Jesus too. When they see us doing what God has called us to do, being different than the rest of the world. And you know, a lot of the stuff that's gone on, uh, thankfully, within the church is being forsaken. And you know, a lot of people, especially young people today are saying, you know, I don't need to go to church for a pizza party. I got a pizza party anytime I want. Church isn't for pizza parties. The church is for preaching. We're hearing the word of God. Amen. And we can have pizza afterwards. Unless you're my wife. She hates pizza. She won't. Uh, as I told you, if you were here last week, that was one of the weirdest things. Oh, by the way, that just reminded me, just for your entertainment purposes. 
you know, I, I mean, they're probably the most hideous thing to eat on the planet, but I love hot dogs. <laughs> Man, I love hot dogs, especially chili dogs. <laughs> I love chili dogs. And back in the day when I was out on the road as a salesman, you know, Terry would pack me a 1,500 calorie lunch and all that. I was out, I forget where I was, I was somewhere up north of the valley and uh, out on the road and I just, man, I gotta have a chili dog. And uh, so I, I went to Wiener Schnitzel, <laughs> got some chili dogs, crammed them down my face, tried not to spill it on my tie and my shirt and was successful at that, which I wasn't usually. Um, and I called Terry, this is early in the days of the cell phone. Remember when the cell phones in your car were this big and they had a suitcase in the trunk? Well, it was back in those days. So I called Terry and out of nowhere, she says, what'd you have for lunch? <laughs> oh, I ate the lunch you gave me, honey. And she says, you know what I'm in the mood for? A chili dog. I confess my sin. I don't even know where that was going, but I just, it popped in my head, so you got it. But you know what? It was, we had a good laugh. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times we get pressured into doing and saying things that we shouldn't. But as soon as we make things right, it feels great again. And everything is back. Uh, there's order in our lives. So listen, don't forsake the word of God. You can't eat once a week, right? Even wiener schnitzel chili dogs won't last for a whole week. You need to eat more often than that. You need to be eating from the Word of God every single day. After all, we threw it up on the screen a couple of weeks ago and uh, it says seven days without reading the Bible makes one week. W-E-A-K. We can't be living powerful for only eating once a week. So get in the book, do what it says, and remember to send portions. Care about those who are around you who are in great need. And those needs can be physical, they can be spiritual, but there are needs all around us and people need us to live powerfully for the gospel of Christ in these last days. Amen? Amen. And Father, we are so grateful for this wonderful chapter and that of Second Chronicles as well. Thank you for these beautiful reminders. But Lord, when we hear the word, sometimes it's a gut punch. Sometimes it's hard when our life isn't lining up with what you said to do. But we thank you also uh, that those moments, there are those who come along and say, hey, wait, 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 don't we rejoice rather that you heard something that got you tracking again. And Lord, I pray that would be our reception when we hear or experience things uh, that tell us there's somewhere where we need to shape up or or something to change, something you've been calling our attention to. And we thank you, Lord, that our immediate arrival at that place brings us to that place, a time of refreshing that comes from the Lord. So we thank you for these things. We thank you for our time together this morning. Be with Bryce and, and Scarlett as they travel, we pray. Use them greatly in India. And Lord, I pray that they would come back with a report of how we can be involved in what's going on over there as well. We thank you for your physical touch on those. We pray for Elena right now too, Lord, Elena Gallegos. Just ask you drive this from her and uh, touch her and heal her completely and permanently, Lord. We thank you that we can come to you and ask for the great and mighty. You said call and you'll answer and show us things that we know not. So we ask you for great and mighty things today and any other who needs your healing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, this is uh, kind of a, a, as I said, a busy month. Next Sunday morning, or next uh, Saturday, actually, I'll be in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, speaking at a Until He Comes conference. Uh, the sub-theme is uh, the importance of eschatology, and I'll be speaking there. I'll be the only speaker at this conference uh, all day Saturday, and then Sunday morning, Calvary Chapel, Franklin. I'll be uh, speaking there at the church, and then come home Sunday night, and the following weekend, I will be up in Longview, Washington, and uh, speaking at Calvary Chapel Kelso, a men's conference on Saturday, then speaking at the church on Sunday, and then home Sunday night. And then the next weekend, 
Uh, I will be in Brookville, Ohio, uh, speaking at a uh, prophecy conference there on Saturday, and then Calvary Chapel Faith Fellowship. Um, I'll be speaking at on Sunday morning. So we've got a busy week, and in the midst of that, Terry's going to be in Virginia, speaking there for a week. And uh, so we would appreciate and covet your prayers uh, for good help. You'll be well fed while I'm gone. Uh, Pastor Josh is speaking next Sunday. And the two Sundays after that, uh, Pastor Bryce will be speaking. Pastor Dave is going to be speaking during one of the times. What are you speaking, Dave? (laughs) I know it's on a Sunday. So (laughs) you'll have to figure that out. But anyway, keep us in prayer. And thank you again for your wonderful prayers for Terry. Uh, God is faithful. Amen.